Welcome to the Queen City Music Podcast, the podcast devoted to the local music scene in Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, here's your host, Matthew Ablin. Hello, Happy New Year, and welcome to episode 52 of the Queen City Music Podcast. This episode of the Queen City Music Podcast is sponsored by Middle Sea Jazz, Charlotte's premier jazz club located at 300 South Brevard Street in Uptown Charlotte. Stop in for Thursday night jazz jams, gospel Sundays every third Sunday of the month, or bi-weekly Wednesdays for Remember Wednesdays. But if you prefer, stay in for the evening and watch their Saturday night live stream, where you'll have access to the best performances Middle Sea Jazz has to offer. And if you want the VIP treatment, get a Baby Grand membership, where life takes you to a higher note. Tickets are now available for Furia Tropical, presenting Latin Rhythms and Salsa Hits on January 1st. J.D. presents the original soul jazz flautist, Althea Renee, on January 8th, and a jazz celebration of Stevie Wonder featuring special guest Adam McKnight, presented by Noel Friedline and Maria Howell on January 27th through the 29th. As we head into 2022, I hope everyone has had an amazing start to their year. I'm not one to make resolutions, but I am definitely planning on creating and releasing more original music. My most recent release, You and Me, is currently on all streaming platforms, and it features some amazing local Charlotte musicians, so I hope you go check it out. If you'd like to find out more about me and all the things I'm up to, head over to my website at matthewablin.com. There's always a link in the show notes to make it easy for you. This month on the QCMP, I'm speaking with Daniel Grimmett, the founder of Dark Label Music. This is a company whose primary focus is working with music producers and helping them develop all aspects of their business. Daniel Grimmett, welcome to the Queen City Music Podcast. It's good to have you. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Are you originally from the Charlotte area? I am. Yep. I was. Uh, I grew up in the Matthews area, went to Providence High School, and uh, yeah, pretty much lived here until I was about 24, mm-hmm. lived in some other places and came back. Okay. So what's your music background? Yeah. So my uh, dad was a band director. And uh, so I always had instruments laying around the house. They were mm-hmm. music fans as well. And I right. always had records on. And uh, yeah, from when I was like a little kid, just started picking up stuff around the house. We had a little piano. We had guitars. Uh, first instrument was drums. And then later got into guitars. And uh, yeah, played in bands throughout middle school and high school and a little bit into college age, uh, early twenties and yeah. And then, uh, got into recording stuff. So currently you're the founder of dark label music. Yep. Can you tell the listeners about dark label music and, and what it is and, and what you, sure. what you do? Yep. Sure. So, uh, dark label music is a business development company. So we focus on, uh, helping music producers, particularly pop producers, commercial music producers, uh, make a living. So in any, any financial pieces of their business, whether it's, uh, the ancillary stuff or, you know, getting clients, uh, building brand, things of that nature. Um, we help with, uh, with that. Okay. Given your music background, how did you actually get involved with doing this kind of business end of things? Yeah, sure. So I played in bands and, um, you know, somebody in the band has to have something to record, right? So sure. I think in the eighth grade, I got a little like all in one task cam thing and <laughs> always really found that, uh, fun, the recording process. And, um, always had a little home studio and did it part time. And, uh, around 2010, I believe I started working for, uh, Chris Garges at Old House, which absolutely. Was yeah. Room. Chris was on. Yep. I was in the old, old house the one in Gastonia, <laughs> and it's, uh, yeah, it was. The new building is awesome, but, uh, yeah, the, the house in Gastonia was wild, man. It was crazy. It was a really cool sp- spot to come up, uh, to come up in. Uh, but I would kind of go back and forth between doing, you know, working there, bringing in my own clients, working with Garges, you know, assisting for his mm-hmm. clients. Yeah. Um, and I would sort of go back and forth. I'd do it for like full time for a while until I ran out of like savings and I'd jump back, get a job, you know, work the job and then leave, <laughs> go back. I kind of went back and forth, but I always had an interest in business as well. My dad, uh, was a sales guy and I kind of grew up listening to him on the phone and stuff. So it was kind of baked into my head. So I would do stuff like, you know, um, 
I did a ton of drugs in, in, in high school and, uh, <laughs> went to, went to rehab and treatment and yeah. stuff. So I didn't have a college, you know, so it's like, what job do you get? Right. Going right, to sales. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I did that and would go back and forth, kind of work in corporate jobs, corporate sales and okay. marketing and various fields, advertising, real estate, various things. And then working with Chris at old house. And, um, yeah, when I was like 24, Chris was like, Hey, you know, I was thinking about moving to LA and he was like, well, I think you, you could do fine wherever, but you know, if you don't do it now, you probably won't do it, you know, ever. Right. So I was like, all right, cool. So I left two weeks later and he actually drove out there with me. We did a nice scenic tour through, through, uh, Colorado and Utah. It was beautiful. And okay. he introduced me to some people. And when I got to LA, um, my sort of perspective changed a bit on what I wanted to do. I started seeing people, this would have been 2012. I started seeing guys like with nice home studios sort of doing everything. Like they were writing with the clients. They were, you know, producing and recording it, mixing right. it. How, how long ago were you talking about? Yeah. So that was, that was like uh 10, 10 ish years ago, like 2012. Wow. So almost at the cusp of home recording studios, uh, really mm -hmm. starting to explode. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I did interviews at the big studios. They were relatively easy to get interviews at and they were all really nice. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, East West and, you know, really nice staff. And I got to hang out and they'd invite you to some parties and stuff. But as far as like getting jobs there at that time, not a lot of people were like graduating up and right. opening up new positions. So I just kind of like, they're like, yeah, go learn how to make tracks and like get your own clients. So. I lived in like a crappy little, you know, one bedroom studio thing in uh, Hollywood and had people just come over, pay me 15 bucks an hour to make tracks for them. And then because of my background in the, or in the, uh, sorry, in the corporate world, I was like, well, Hey, they don't really need to be here. I could do this online. Right. And started Sarning Team. This is the long version of how we get to dark labels. So oh, that's fine. I'll shorten it up here. So basically I ran Sarning Team. It was my job there to, uh, you know, to obviously procure the work, get clients, sure. but also hire the talent. And, uh, through that, I just naturally kind of started developing my team, right. Of writers and producers mm -hmm. that worked for the company. And, uh, around 2018, everybody kind of moved on. Like, uh, the, the writer got signed to Cobalt. The producer went out to LA to do other things. And I was kind of left there like, Hmm, what do I want to do next? You know, I'd kind of hit, I would kind of like hit all the goals I wanted to hit. Yeah. So I was in a position, it was actually not a great place to be head, head space wise. Um, you don't actually want to hit the goals. <laughs> I didn't learn that. So after <laughs> you have to keep the, the goalposts moving or you sure. Well, once yeah. you hit one, what's the next goal? What's right. The next goal. How do I do this? So what I, did, do I, do? I yeah. didn't have much vision beyond that. And I hit yeah. the goal and then kind of went to a little bit of a depression, but anyway, got out of it and was like, Hey, what do I want to do? And it's much more challenging to help other producers, like get their act together when it comes to business. Sure. Versus running my own, it got kind of repetitive. So that's what uh, prompted me to to start the consulting company, Dark Label. So you started that in 2018, is what we were talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then you have your partner, Mike Mani. Mike yeah. comes on in 2021. So what's what's happening between 2018 and 2021? This this last year that Mike came on. Yeah, so I think the first couple of years was really just like putting in my dues and like figuring out. I had never been like a consultant before. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, figuring out like really who our ideal clients are and, and trying a lot of different things and just getting used to the bit, you know, there are some similarities on how you get, you know, uh, production work and client right. and, right. and like consulting work, but there was a lot of differences too. So I'd, I hired mentors in that space. It was just kind of putting in my dues in the trenches to even see if it would be a real thing. Um, and then Mike came along, Mike found me through YouTube in 2020. And we just kind of had a, you know, kept a conversation going. Uh, did you know him previously or no, no, I know his work, but I didn't know him. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so we just kind of kept a relationship going. Like at one point he was going to become a client. Like I was going to help him do some like digital product stuff. Sure. And you know, I just I was like, man, he could bring a lot to the table for our other clients. So Mike came on, um, and it's still relatively new. We're still sort of getting him fully integrated into, into the, into the business. Um, but he, he came on because he fills a gap that I couldn't really help. I'm more on the like online entrepreneurial side of things, the, the mental side of things, helping people just get over those, you know, obstacles and stuff. And, uh, and he's, he really understands the industry side, right? You know, he's, he spent 
uh, 25 plus years in like your more traditional major label industry side. So he can help them with navigating that piece of, you know, part of the world. So, or part, yeah, part of the music industry. Well, that was one of the things I found interesting about you and, and dark label is that although you are Charlotte based, which is a wonderful thing for our community to have a, a, a company like yours here, you're not, ha- you don't have a ton of clients from Charlotte. You actually are, as you said earlier, you're internet based. So you got clients all over the place coming and, and that you're working with all over the country, if not the world. Yep. That's correct. Couple here in Charlotte, but yeah, most are other, other places. Why did you find it lucrative to not have a, as it were, a, uh, uh, a, a brick face building to work out of as as opposed to just doing the internet. How did that, how does that benefit you as a, as a business? Well, we do have that too. Um, over in, uh, like the Oakhurst area. Okay. So some friends, some friends of mine, we all have like, a, they're photographers. So it's, I think a 4,000 square foot warehouse and, uh, most of it is photography stuff. And mm-hmm. I have an office in there. Um, but that's just so I don't always have to work in my apartment right, to right. be honest. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, that's all I've known. I mean, my, my history of like making a living in the music is the music industry has always been online. So it's kind of all I know. Um, okay. so, and it's like, it, if there's no reason for some, for a business to be bound to location, you know, why, why bound it to that location? So. Is it beneficial to you? Now you've got your partner, Mike, he's on the West coast. He's in LA. Mm-hmm. You're here in Charlotte. Uh, was that by design that you had, do you, you be bi-coastal with the company? Um, not necessarily. I mean, definitely like when, particularly in pop, the pop producer world, I mean, it's, it certainly can add a little bit of quote unquote, uh, you know, clout, I guess if, yes. if someone's in LA. Um, but, uh, it just happened to be where he lived and, um, and I lived here. So it, it would be cool. We'd love to do like events and stuff in the future. So it'd be kind of nice that like the clients that live closer to that side right. of the world can go to that one. And the ones that live closer to here can come to the Charlotte one. So that would be cool. He's got a building out there as well, like a studio suite. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, but outside of that just so happened to be where he lit, you know, he he's been there for 20 years and I like it here and I have no intention of living there again. So. <laughs> <laughs> I like the East coast and I, and I do like the, the, the Southeast. Yeah, it's beautiful it's nice. down here. All right, so let's dig in a little bit into Dark Label. First off, sure. you, you work with producers predominantly. Yeah. So what's a producer? Wait, how do how do we define that in this in this day and age yeah. for for everybody? It's you know, it's not it's not going to uh Capitol Records and you're a producer who works with Def Leppard or something like that and works with a, with a major band. How do you guys define that in in today's music world that you're working with? Yeah, it's not a fancy answer, but um Really, anyone that that makes music, you know, if you have the capability mm-hmm. to put a song together, you're you're a producer in, in in some form. And of course, they have the more traditional producers, they have executive producers, they have you know more beat makers that right. just work on the composition. Um, yeah, I just look at it as anyone that can can make me. A lot of artists are producers. Who we particularly work with are, you know, we say pop producers, which is kind of a broad term. Um, but the reason we say pop producers is it's generally someone that can compose like melodically. Right. So okay. hip hop beat market, slightly different market, um, different business model. They generally aren't working like directly with like, they're not composing to, you know, a melodic song that's mm-hmm. been written. Some of them can, many of them can, but a pop artist can def or a pop producer can definitely do that. Cause that's, that's their job. Sure. So a lot of them come up like playing instruments and stuff, but because they're pop and they're working with pop artists, generally they, they can in most cases have a model where they're able to work remote, you know, like I could help a rock producer. Like we we've had some rock producers, but if that requires, if their style is being in the band, uh, being in the room with the band, which is super fun, but they live in the middle of Iowa. Like there's nothing I can do for them. Like it's just, I can't drop off bands there. So we kind of whittled it down to like, okay, pop producers making commercial music, tend to be the ones that kind of check all the like bullet points of just who we can help the most. Okay. You know? doesn't mean like that's, Oh, is that the best way to make money? Or it's like, no, it's like whatever one you like doing is probably going to be the best way for you to make money. It's just right. for our particular business where we're getting hired to, you know, hit milestones for people and help them get results. The kind of more narrow you go, the better. Cause you can really understand that one particular market and that business model. So, 
That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I would imagine that is the case, that you're not trying to cast a wide net and say, hey, we're just working with all producers, although you can. It's like this is our specialty. This is the folks we really have proven a proven track record with to work with. Right, especially for the ones that are like kind of semi – most of the folks we work with are like – you know, semi-established, you know, they're not, mm-hmm. they're not that, uh, dark label doesn't teach production or anything. Like at that point, you know how to produce, you probably, right. because the ones that really have, like, obviously someone that's just starting their business has some pain, um, because like it seems so new to them. Right. But where you really start to have pain is when you dedicate your entire life to it, you've gotten a taste of like kind of making it work and then you get stuck. Right. Like, those, that's who really needs help. So like, we were kind of semi-established to established people, mm-hmm. but – and not to jump ahead, I am involved in some other businesses that do help kind of a wider market and cover you know, things like that. Right. So there are things we do. It's just not dark label specifically, not that business that does the so, broad stuff. So you say semi-established to established producers. Do you take any producers who are kind of almost just starting out under your wing and say, hey, OK, this is, this is how it's done. Let's, let's get this ball rolling? Well, I would I would probably send them to a different business that we're a part of to get started um, because they need to kind of probably get their skills happening first, okay. you know, and like get their first work and just kind of learn the business mm-hmm. more. Um, so I'm, I'm a part of a, a, another business as well that uh, Dark Label owns a portion of um, called the Full-Time Music Producer. And it's more mm-hmm. of like a college program. It's like three businesses put together. Um it's a, a company called mastering.com, which teaches people okay. how to master songs and become a mastering engineer. And that's cool because even if someone doesn't want to be a mastering engineer, like they just learn critical listening and mm-hmm. how to set the rooms up really nicely and all that. Uh, and then the other program is called hybrid musician, which teaches people how to produce and mix and covers like a nice overview of all the different kind of money making models. Okay. Uh, not too in depth, but just cover, you know, here's what sync licensing is. Here's, how I can get into it. Here's how to release music. Yeah. And then full-time music producer is more of the, like, here's how to go get clients and build a clientele. So they combine those three together. It's called musician on a mission. It's like an online college. So I think it's kind of interesting when you think producer, I, in my head, the first thing of course comes to mind is a large record label, you know, the producers who produce big yeah. bands, but today, I mean, the music industry is the wild west. I mean, there's just so much going on on the ground level because you won't, you won't get picked up by a major label unless you have a whole bunch of things already in place. So being that you have all these, for lack of a better word, lower tier, mm-hmm. uh, m- artists, musicians, producers, record companies that are not the majors, somebody's got to take care of all these folks and somebody's got to do it. And it's interesting that you have a company that's, that's providing that service to yep. get, to get to those folks who are, who are mid-level or, 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 or a little bit above yep. who may not be quote unquote ready for the majors, or maybe they are. I don't know. Well, we work with major level producers as well, because sometimes what they want to do is. Yeah. People uh, like just because they, they have like cuts on a major label, like they're usually not in most cases, they're not like on staff from the label. So like, okay. You know, just because they have a major label like project that came out doesn't mean they're like set for life, you know? Wow. Okay. Just means that, uh, they, they got the job for that particular record, you know? But wouldn't it lead to more work for them if, if they, they did well? If they do, you yes. If, if they know how to move, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. If they know how to leverage momentum, um, you know, leverage one thing into another and yeah. get some momentum. Um, but a lot of them want to, like, there's just generally way more money on the internet, so a lot of them want to get into that game. So we may have like a major load produced that comes to us that's like, hey, I want to launch like a sample pack or something or build mm-hmm. my brand online or, right. or whatever. Um, and you'll see some guys that kind of play in both of those sandboxes. They're, you know, they have major label credits, but also are kind of like have some online presence and have various businesses that, that they own. Um, so. So, yeah, so it could be anyone, but yeah, I'd say the bulk of the, of the people are, are yeah, like what, what, a lot of producers are like, well, I can't like make good money until I get credits. And it's like, well, most produce, most working producers don't have major level credits. Right. That's the minority. That, yeah. You're talking about the top like 1% of producers. Sure. So that, that is definitely not the, the majority. That's, that's the minority. Most working producers don't have cre- huge credits and Grammys, you know? Um, but they still make a living, right? They're on their way to that if, if that's their, their goal to pursue that. Or maybe they work on genres that are kind of more obscure and they don't really care about that, that right. stuff. You know, that's another option. Um, 
So, so yeah, that's just one, one little section, but, uh, yeah. So th- you're working with these producers and you're working on business development for them. Correct. Okay. What does that entail and what does yeah. that, what does that mean? Cause I mean, that, right. that could mean a billion different billion things, things yeah. but what Sometimes does that mean does. for your, for your company? And, and how does that mean? What is your approach to that with working with these folks? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, generally how we do things is we have, at this point, a lot of like content made that kind of teaches them how to do certain things. Okay, hold on. Freeze mm-hmm. before we sure. – I, I, I just backtrack one second. Yeah. So you have a producer come in and wants to work with you. How how does somebody get to work with you in the right. first place? So you have a new person. Let's say I'm, I'm a new uh, potential client of yours yeah. and I want to come work with you. What is that? How does that work sure. for you? And then, and then how do you develop a, a professional development or business plan for, for me? Yep. Yep. So generally what they would do is they would start with, um, we have kind of a, a intake form, if you will, of a bunch of questions okay. just to kind of see where they're at and sort of gauge, does this make, you know, are they in the direction of someone that we could help? And then we start with usually a little 15 minute introduction call where I dig even deeper and just kind of hear how they talk and hear like, You know, again, just to make sure it's cool. Right. Then we'll have about an hour long call where we actually map things out. This is before they've paid us a dime, by the Mm -hmm. way. This is all just our intake process. It's pretty little intense, but you're pretty stringent um, on who you take. Very. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Yeah. In that in dark label. Yes. The college is a bit more broad, but yeah, we'll dig into the college a little bit. Dark labels. Yeah. 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 For sure. We take about eight people a month. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we have a call and then I make them an offer. Then we have a third call just to go through the offer, take care of the financial piece, and then we dive in. So that's how they would become a client. And that would be day one onboarding would start like on that third call. Okay. Um, Is that just because I'm – curious that financial piece that mm-hmm. what, they're, what they're paying is that based on each client individually and what you're going to offer them or is that is it a, is it a set fee that you that you require it, it can year? range it can range um yeah it can range it depends on how long we're working together like how much i feel like i'm gonna have to put like my sort of um creative like intellectual like ideas and you know property into it like mm-hmm. okay i'm gonna have to come up with ideas for this person's product if like i'm coming up with ideas for the product i want to get paid more than if like they already have an idea and i'm right. just helping them execute it right so it just like comes down to little things like that um but uh yeah so so then we start and basically the the, the process is we they have b- some some roadmaps and uh depending on what kind of model they're pursuing what business model they go through that. They learn kind of how to do it. Okay. And then we just go do it. So a lot of it is just direct one-to-one on the phone. We're putting together things. I'm talking through it. And usually we work most clients a minimum of 12 months, six to wow. 12 months okay. uh, minimum. Most of them stay. I mean, it's only been op- you know open for three years. But like we have a lot of people that have been there since the beginning. So can you give um, us a, a little more specific of, of sure. like what it, what does that mean for business development? So I'm a new person yeah. coming into you. Maybe I already have a background in music and 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 some production yeah, skills sure. under my thing. What what do you what's the first thing you kind of look for and say yeah. we kind of need to find your weak areas or develop exactly. build up your yeah. strong areas? What yeah, it mean? depends on where the problems are. You know, some guys come and they're like, dude, I'm slam with work and I want a life. Right. So it's like, okay, well, we don't need to help that person find clients. We need to help that person develop operations and team. Right. So, or someone comes and it's like, man, I feel like my stuff is really good, but I just can't get artists to pay me like the amount I need to live. Like their economics are off. Okay. We come in and, and we take a look and it's like, they're a lot of producers set their rates based on like emotion, like how they feel like their self worth is what it's like. It's just economics. So it's literally right. like, what do we need to make? Divide up by the hours you this need to This is what work. the going rate is in the field yeah. is you have to at least charge this. But it's, yeah, yeah. And like they can go beyond like what – there is no – in my book, no standard really because it's like there's so much intrinsic value that could be at. Like how do you price that, right? Like sure. you know, someone that has a hit can charge more because there's more intrinsic value. It doesn't mean the person you is going to work with next has a hit you know, or will have one, but there's intrinsic value there. But there's, isn't there isn't there a, a value in that sense of – if there's somebody who doesn't have a hit and doesn't have a name name recognition, there's a baseline that you c- c- kind of charge, and then there's somebody who's got name recognition. There's a baseline that they're going to charge. I mean, you, the person who's got big name recognition is probably not going to charge as little as somebody who's got no re- name recognition. Would would I be right? Or You'd be surprised? Really? For indie artists, yeah. Wow. Again, yeah, like that is for the most part not life changing. 
unless you're like massive, like a, like a, you've had hits over hits over hits over hits over hits over hits. Yeah. Like just because you had a major label cut, like doesn't really mean anything. Like, hmm. you know, like, uh, Mike, my partner produced one of the tracks on the air, the Eric Clapton collaboration on supernatural. Like he's not living off of that. Right. Uh, he probably didn't even get paid much for that. You know? So like, yeah, people think that like you just get all this money from it. It's like, maybe, is it a massive hit? Like, is it like, it just depends. Like, what was the deal? What is your pub company taking like all of your crap? Like, do you not right. have a, you may have a crappy deal. Like who knows? Um, so, so yeah, but, and some independent producers are very good at sales. So like, they just may be more confident to ask for more. And I've heard, you know, I've, I've definitely heard of independent uh, producers asking for very high fees, even like out of scope from what I kind of, Go yeah. with, you know, um, I guess there's the motto. If you don't ask, you don't get. So. Yeah. So it just depends. And like, there's other ways to bring value to the table and like, um, you know, perhaps that independent producer is very good at like developing artists in the beginning and, and creating a sound. Right. And that's what that artist wants. Right. You know, um, so there's, there's a lot of different ways to bring kind of value to the table. Okay. But at the end of the day, yeah, their economics have to make sense. And kind of what I was getting at is, They'll come to us maybe and they're like working like 80 hours a week. And then we do the math and it's like they're making six bucks an hour. And it's like, well, you know, like you literally have to charge more. And they're like, well, how do I do that? It's like, well, here's frameworks on how to do that. So that would be one thing we would plug into their business. Okay, I get the framework, but I'm terrified to ask for more. Okay, great. Now we need to get in the mental side, right? So now we have some business therapy we need to do. So it's a lot of that. It's just like whatever they – wherever their obstacles are, we come in and we either provide – a mix generally provide a mix of, you know, material and coursework on it. So they know the concepts and then, you know, one-to-one -one conversations and strategy. So it almost correct me if I'm wrong. It almost sounds like you're providing for a consulting, uh, you're, you're a, cons a music consultant because a lot of musicians have no idea or maybe even producers have no idea the business end of things. They know that this is what I want to do. Um, whatever. I play guitar in a band. I don't know how to make more money besides go out and do this. Well, there's a whole network of things that you can do in the, in the music business that you can make money at multiple streams of income, as it were. And it sounds like you're doing that, not even just multiple streams of income, but multiple streams of business that people have no idea are, are there for them. And you're, de you're helping them develop those business skills. Yep. Yeah. That, it's it's it? a consulting firm at the, yeah. Business development is just kind of like a industry term. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a consulting company for okay. sure. Yeah. Developing their businesses basically. But some of the stuff we can like plug in, for example, right? Like let's say like a producer doesn't have access to certain people in the industry. It's like, mm -hmm. well, cool. If you're our client now you do, you know, cause of Mike, like, or, Hey, like I want to help my artist because I know that if my artists do better, I'll do better. But I don't know how to do that. Great, we will do that. Okay, we have resources and of people that will help your artist with everything they need to do, so it makes you look better. So it's it's like consulting. There's also a little bit of a membership element to it too. Mm -hmm. Like we put them in a network of working producers because a lot of people are like, well, I only charge two hundred songs because that's what everybody else around me charges. I was like, well, what if everybody around you charged a thousand? What would you charge? probably a thousand or 900 or somewhere around. It's like, okay, cool. Well, changing your environment can be done. So let's do that. So it's, it's a little bit of like a, um, kind of a cheesy term, like a mastermind community, you know, a, 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 a group, a membership, and then, yeah, but with one-on-one yeah. -on -one access and resources. So like we just look at, okay, if it's a pop producer who's, you know, semi-established, they don't have to be completely full-time yet. Maybe they're part-time and kind of teetering in and out. Like I was in the beginning sure. between jobs like, okay, what – list out all their problems for that one market. How do we solve every single one of those problems for that market? So that's kind of how we how we do it. So instead of going wide, we say let's take one type of producer and try to solve all their problems. So with DLM, um, are you doing this all yourself? Not, not meaning – not with Mike, but do you have – you mentioned mastermind groups. So do you have a collection of producers who meet on a regular basis and talk about the issues that they're having yep. and how to solve them? Is that, is that something, mm -hmm. is that a, is that a thing for you guys? Yep. Yeah. There's about 80 people in it right now. Oh, it usually wow. stays under a hundred because you have people graduating out and then some staying. And then we have some alumni that we keep in there mm -hmm. just to help 
the newer guys. Um, so yeah, they have access to that, excuse me, 24 seven. And then we do, uh, scheduled, uh, yeah, like scheduled events and things in there. That's pretty could be fantastic. Q and A's. Yeah. We could be bringing in other people, could be classes. Uh, sometimes they'll break out and do their own thing. Right. Um, yeah. It's just, just housing like a little Facebook group. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you, it, you have a whole system basically at this point mm-hmm. of, of, of where, what, how you're going to funnel the folks. Okay. You yep. need X, Y, and Z. Let's do this. Once you've mastered X and Y, we're going to go back to A and we're going to build that up because right. you might need that and, and, and how that works. Yep. That's not, a, not a perfect system, but yes, a system yeah. nonetheless. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> it's it, always but, evolving. I feel I'm always kind of, yeah. Well, I think it should. Changing. I mean, yeah. cause the music industry is just changing. I mean, nobody knows really what which way is up anymore. Right. You know, I've had this conversation with people a lot and it's just, you know, you get told all these things and you're like, well, no, that's not really the way it works. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's that the world is just crazy. I mean, I can go out and record an album now and I put it out and, you know, just cause I put it out and it streams on a service does not mean I'm getting a million listens. Right. You know, just cause I'm famous and I put out an album and I have a million followers does not mean a million people are going to buy my album. Yep, exactly. I yeah. mean, it's just nobody knows what 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 anything means anymore. It's, you can it's get crazy. the million listens and then say, okay, well, that doesn't mean I can still pay my bills. So how am I gonna? There's obviously a million listens there. There's some some kind of fan base developing. So how do I leverage that into other things? What yeah. do those people want from me? You know? Yeah. Um. So is it some kind of experience or a live thing, or do they want just more intimate interaction? Do I need to be doing Patreon? Like, what is it? You know, there, it's knowing how to leverage again, like yeah, one thing into the other. Yeah. Um, and create momentum. So we were talking earlier and you had, uh, an MBA, a producer MBA that you guys were doing, but we've talked about how that kind of cut got is kind of been cut out. So can you explain to what's, what's going on now with that? Yeah. That was just meant to be kind of a like broader, uh, program that just covered some more areas for people just getting into the business it was meant to kind of replicate if I created what I thought like a, like what music colleges should be teaching. Yes. That was that. Um, and then the, the, that would be a lead in into the development. But what happened is I had a, that company I mentioned earlier, a musician on a mission came to me earlier this year mm-hmm. and just kind of made a deal that I couldn't refuse. So I decided to build with a, them a program for them called full time music producer. Okay. Which is essentially what the MBA was going to be. Uh, but the cool thing is they handle like, you know, they're a multi-million dollar company. So they have operations, marketing, sales team, like they handle all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I just design the curriculum and show up and teach. So it's more of like a, um, you know, kind of like college professor style sure. teaching and stuff. Were these folks that, that you knew previously or was it just a company that had heard about you, like what you were doing and decided to reach out and touch base with you? Yeah. Um, so I did know about them because the owner of that, we share some of the same business mentors. Okay. Um, most of our business, most of these business mentors I talk about like are outside of the music industry. So not music. Like, yeah, but it is a network. I mean, yeah, essentially it doesn't yeah. even matter if it's music, you're Cause in business. He, Cause he started as a YouTube, like that was one of the big channels I was mentioning earlier. So like part of that business now, you know, gives me access to a big YouTube channel. Um, so he was kind of coming from the YouTube and course space and, uh, so I knew of the company and then what happened was one of my clients, uh, a mix engineer and, and another YouTuber named Jason Moss, he had a channel called Behind the Speakers Okay, and I worked with him. We knocked it out of the park and then he was like, hey, you need to meet my friend Rob because Rob's like kind of doing what you do, but they're like a whole different level of company, you know, staff and all that kind of stuff. I was like, yeah, cool. So we just kind of met and like I gave him some content. I was like, yeah, hey, free, feel free to use this with your students. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it got to a point where they decided to take the business in a different direction where they were going to go and, um, you know, just expand in a lot of things and really try to change. They have a mission of like changing education for creative people. And I really vibed with that mission and they were like, cool. Well, the missing piece of like our music side is, is this. So we need someone that has a track record in that to kind of come pull the music side together. And I think they may go into other industries, but is that an online course that you've, yep, you've it's developed? like a combination. Yeah. It's like, it's like three big online courses that all have their own communities and their own mm-hmm. weekly Q and A's wow. with the teacher. So it's, 
Yeah, it's like kind of like almost like a college. It has like yeah, it's a lot of stuff. It's like that's like a lifetime thing. Like they they enroll in it once. It's almost like paying for college once, but having access to it forever, which is really cool. Given that the company's in business, you know, as long as the company's in good standing, they have access forever. Is it all complete so, now, or are you have you just started to do it with them? So the two main programs have been around for a couple of years, which is the Mastering dot com and Musician on a Mission, which is hybrid musician is like their okay. big uh, product. What I'm doing, full time music producer, uh, we have, um, we're we're in, still in the beta group, so um, we have a couple months in the game, yeah. So yeah, we still have a lot of work to do, but I think there's about 30 students in there now. By the end of, they're like currently on enrollment calls as we speak. Like they'll probably get it up to about 50 people in in January, and then we'll have the course because I make it week by week for 12 weeks, so it should be done around February, into February, mm -hmm. and then by that point, it'll be ready for like public launch. So, man, that almost sounds like something that you could cater to a university uh, that has a, a music department and say, "Hey, we're gonna we'll sell you this program, and and this is what'll cost for your students to get in or offer it through them." I mean, because. Look, I went to school for music and I went to school for performance degree and an education degree, but the, the business has changed so much now that if there were courses like that, I bet you would probably have a batch of musicians getting into yeah. it just to take – at least take the course, you know? It doesn't yep. mean that they have to go that way and become full-time producers, but you know, taking a course and getting some knowledge yep. in it would probably be huge for them. So this company technically competes with universities, oh, so okay. I don't know if they're into that. But I, I would love to do just like yeah, some some. I've always wanted to do some guest. Uh, I have a friend. We have a friend in town, um, Kevin McCloskey, Black Pearl. He's like a big hip hop producer. Um, I'm sorry, mixer in town. He does like all the the baby stuff and like all that that mm -hmm. crew of uh, hip hop guys that have kind of blown up from Charlotte. He's a he's a awesome talent, and he'll go up to App and do some like guest speaking and stuff and. Uh, I always thought that would be fun, but as far as the, I think they'll make more money owning it themselves than if they were to license it to universities. Cause Got it. you know, it's like, they're probably not going to sp spend much of the budget on it. And these guys, yeah, these guys are like, you know, I feel the, uh, the future of like what education is going to look like. They're on the cutting edge. So I think they want to like kind of go all into that and, uh, but that's really up to them. So <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I'm really fascinated by it because it's cool. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Not that I want to take, you know, too much far interview yeah. talking about, but I think the it, education in general is changing, but music education is really changing. And unless you're becoming a teacher and you actually need a certificate, like people ask me, you know, I went to school to study classical guitar mm -hmm. and it, you know, would you go back and do that again? And I don't know if I would, because given the state of things, and what I know now, I might just pick up and move to that city if there's a particular person I wanted to study with and go take lessons with them in person, you know, X amount of times a year or move there and, you know, and take lessons with them on a regular basis. Or, you know, if I need to, you take them online. Right. So yeah. depending on what you want, I mean, the whole point of getting a degree in something is, is, is becoming uh, moot. Right. Yeah, and there's there's definitely still some good schools that I would like recommend, and there could be something set, you know, particularly for a kid coming out of high school, to, like go and get that experience, like being around people and all. Yeah, so, oh, that is given that they huge, don't yeah. have to go into yeah. debt because all the ones I recommend are like the most expensive ones in the world. Yeah, <laughs> like Belmont and stuff like that were wildly expensive. I think like one out of every four. I can't remember if it was Belmont or Vanderbilt. It's like one out of every four students is in the top one percent. Right. right. It's big money. But so I realize that may not be an option for a lot of people. I'm just saying like, specifically more music, music yeah. related. Like, yeah, well, their music school specifically, they have a good commercial music program yeah. at, at Belmont um, that a lot of kids get. Just the ones I met that have come out of that seem to know their stuff. And I'm sure there's more. But, right. uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it, there's not a lot of like, the issue is if you are, an accredited school because you want to be able to provide finance like traditional financial assistance. Right. You there's a lot of red tape with updating your curriculum. So like you can't just be like, we're changing the curriculum today. And sure. says, you have to get it like approved and like all this red tape. And by the time you do that, it's like already changed. So it's not that they like wouldn't want to teach what you need to know or, you know, and I think they can make up for it by bringing in guest speakers and stuff. But uh, yeah, it's hard for a traditional university to keep up just because there's so much red tape with yeah. changing things. So change gears a little sure. bit. 
you, I was saying earlier about multiple streams of income, but in your business, you have multiple streams of things that you do. Mm-hmm. So you, you don't only have the regular business stuff, you know, working with the clients directly, but you also operate a podcast of your own. Yep. Music Pro Daily. Fill us in about the Music Pro Daily. I wouldn't call it a business stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just uh, part of what you do it's, it's as part of, of the business. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's promotion. Yeah. Promotion and marketing. Which play. I think is is, is brilliant. Yeah. I mean, you have a three-pronged thing. Yeah. Well, like deep down, I want to be a YouTuber. Uh-huh. And uh, <laughs> I'm still working on that. But uh, YouTube, you have to kind of have like – you don't have to, but like the videos work better if there's a format and you kind of keep it short and like yeah. exciting and stuff. So I still like doing that. That's fun. Um, but the podcast was more of just like, uh, where I can just kind of vamp and like, it's almost more like of a diary of like, here's what I'm doing in the trenches today. Like, here's a problem that came up with a producer, right? Uh, the stuff that people don't get to really hear. And it started as like a daily thing. It's called music pro daily. Cause me and a friend, a mix engineer in Australia mm-hmm. were trading off and doing it daily, but he moved on to doing some other, some other things. And, uh, so I, it's not daily anymore. It's <laughs> podcast is hard to keep up with. That's why I do this monthly. It's, it's making yeah. a daily commitment, weekly commitment, or it, even bi-weekly is a, it's huge. It wasn't horrible with two people because that's 10 episodes each a month. But if you listen to it, it's only like, Six to ten minutes, like of me. Right. Here's what's going. On. It's not like a fully produced thing like right. this with guests and stuff. Um, like I'll take clips of this and use it on there, and that'll be an episode. It's stuff like that. But, yeah. um, but yeah, right now I haven't been in a great habit, but uh, I like to at least do it a couple times a week. So, so the question I wanted to ask you about sure. your podcast about Music Pro Daily is that geared towards folks like me who would just be like, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just listen to various podcasts and I like listening to music. Uh, related podcasts or is it really geared towards people and clients that you're working with? You're like, Hey, this is for you. You know, this month I'm talking about this really, yeah. really quickly. It's geared towards working music professionals okay. for sure. Yeah. Particularly producers. Although I think a lot of people can get some things out of it. Cause a lot of the stuff we talk about is like kind of the mental side of things. Cause it's the, it's actually like ninety percent of it, but that's not exciting to talk about. So we don't we don't say that publicly. <laughs> you, you sell them what they want and then give them what they need. There but you go. Uh, yeah, so that stuff. I have even my buddies are like photographers listen to it. But oh, it's great episodes. Oh, sweet. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's geared towards working music professionals. Yeah, the kind the kind of uh, folks that we would work with at Dark Label. And and you also have a blog that you do. Yeah, I just sort of put stuff from other places onto it. I don't really write blogs much anymore. Um, yeah, I noticed a lot of them were just video blogs. Just video. I, I did a lot of blogging back. It's just not like much of a strategy anymore. Like yeah. 10 years ago, it got us a ton of business with the production company. Sure. So people would find us through Google and stuff like that. But Dark Label really isn't the kind of business where people find just find you through Google. One, they don't even know people like me exist. They're probably not searching for yeah. it. So a lot of our business comes from referrals, obviously. And then just like people coming across like a podcast or a YouTube video and being like, and, and since I'm like a guy on the internet that talks about money, generally they're not just like jumping to reach out to me. You know what I yeah. mean? They're like, well, let me check this guy out and like listen to his stuff. So a lot of people that I end up getting on the phone with, they've been listening to the, some of the stuff or talking to people I've worked with for probably months before I ever even hear from them hmm. just to do their due diligence. Um, yeah, so I it's, imagine it's – it's. You know. Just talking to you about it, it sounds like it's an up and coming field. Do you know of any other businesses yeah. like Dark Label that are doing yeah, yeah, what yeah. you do? Mm-hmm. Yep. And, uh, yeah, more and more are starting to kind of pop up, which is good because it makes it more of a thing. Yeah. I mean, I still want to be the best. And of course, <laughs> that's, that's, that's uh, kind of the goal. No, to, there, to there's be probably the best a no, like the most notable one, I think, is a different market. Their, their background's more from like, uh, recording. Rock band is a metal metal world. But mm-hmm. It's called Six Figure Home Studio. It's actually been around since like two, I think I've heard of that 2012 one. or so. It's been around since way before yeah. I was doing this. Like Brian Hood's an uh, incredible business guy and, and great producer. And um, I don't know that he does. He might do consulting. Uh, I don't actually know that for sure. But he's had, he's got some great courses and stuff. And sure. I think recently they moved into doing kind of targeting all creative freelancers, which is neat. So. Um, photographers and all sorts of, of people, but yeah, he's been around and then, yeah, there's just some various guys, uh, that, that do, uh, kind of a similar, similar thing. Yeah. But. Well, uh, here's my next question. And I don't know, sound like I'm overstepping my downs, but I'm going to ask sure. anyway. Yeah. There's other companies out there. What is it that Daniel Grimmett and dark, dark label music are going to offer somebody who's wants to become a professional producer? What are you offering? With your skill set that, you know, maybe another company is not. 
So my advice to anyone like hiring a company is like, go look at the clients they work with. And do you want to be like those people? Basically, that's the one to choose. So you may come and look at my clientele and be like, eh, I don't really like look like any of these people. I'm not related. You know, it's right. not really relatable to me. Um, you know, and you may find someone else like, okay, this guy's like the best at like get, helping hip hop producers sell beats. Like, okay, well, sure. I relate more to that. So let me, let me go with, with that guy. Um, so I think the first thing is that like our track record is very upfront. Like, you know, who we work with mm -hmm. and you can like go see who those people are, see the results, talk to them. Uh, it's very transparent as where a lot of the online education stuff, like, They'll put some success stories. We can't actually see who it is. They're not putting who their last name is. Like you don't actually see if these are these people even real producers, right? right. Um, and then I think the what what we bring to the table is the mix of Mike and I. Uh, so we understand both the online world and, and marketing, you know, yeah. that side of things, as well as the industry side of things. So I think we're the only one that has like that broad of a spectrum. Hmm. Uh, most of my competitors aren't industry people. They don't have any like, you know, background in that. Uh, and I don't either. So like, that's why I have a partner that, that does that. Right, right. So, uh, and I think we're, there may be a couple of others, but we're definitely one of the few where like we work very in the trenches with the clients, like one-on-one, -on -one, like conversation, you know, on the phone and, and I'm pretty much on the phone. Oh, that's my job. Um, I'm, I'm curious. Have you had any clients that you did not want to work with. Like you, you got involved with them and then you started to realize, Oh, this may, I may have made a mistake here trying to take this client on. They're not, they said they were one thing. They're not really, or they said they were, they wanted to do this, but they're not really into it. They're, no matter what I do with them, they, they're just throwing sour grapes on it. They're not willing to try or do. Yeah. It's, it's, it's rare and dark label because of like the intake process and yeah. just the kind of level that they're generally at. But of course it's happened. It like didn't go as well as you want. And sometimes, dude, sometimes it's been on my end. I say that because I get really bummed about it. I'm like, yeah, man, yeah. I don't feel like I brought it that time. Like I, I we could have done more, tried more. Well, it's always the case. You, yeah. You, did I do enough? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it happens rarely now where it's just, if it gets to a point where it's just like not a fit, we decide that and we move forward right from there. You know, here's your money back. And like, you know, let's just, or, or sometimes they don't want their money back. They're just like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm going to continue elsewhere. It's like, okay, no sweat. We'll have a conversation. We'll, um, um, what's the process called? Like come up with like an exit strategy for both parties. That makes sense. And usually they go very well. Um, but that's very rare. Maybe that happens like one, one to two times a year. Right. So out of a hundred clients, maybe one to 2%. Yeah. It just ends up, or sometimes it's not even that. It's just like they get another big opportunity and it doesn't make sense to continue with us. They're yeah. like, well, I want to put all my time into that thing. Yeah. That's happened before, but dude, it, they all end up being a, um, a learning experience. I'm glad they all happen. Cause I need to know that data to be like, cause it's just as much my fault if I take someone that like isn't a fit, you know? Yeah. Well, so, I just know being, yeah. being, having been around music for three decades, <laughs> I date yeah. myself that, that, just because somebody says they're a musician, they don't operate the same way you do. You know, they're, they're not as professional. They're always somebody willing to complain about, I can't make a living doing this. I'm not even, no, right. I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that. I only want to do this. And, uh, you know, and they don't put the same effort forth as somebody else who's a go getter and is like, Oh, I'm going to do this. Yeah. You know? Yeah. With dark label, these are all, all people that are proven before they even get an offer, right. you know? Um, so you, we have a lot of like, different criteria that we look at before and just to make sure. Yeah. Like if people just want to like try it out or thinking, or they're just really new or something, then, then we have, that's like what the full-time music producers, gotcha. not to say that doesn't help people that are more established. It absolutely does. And we have some people in that program that are more established, but maybe they're not quite the demographic for, for dark label. Yeah. Um, and they still get a ton of value. It's, it's the same kind of approach. It's just a bit wider, um, and yeah, it's college, right? So there's going to be some people that never show up to anything. And then there's going right. to be people that are like, you know, blow them up my Facebook messenger that are, you know, teacher's pet kind of thing. How do I do this? That was great. And I, either way is fine. Like whatever yeah. they want to do. Um, so yeah, but luckily with dark label, it's all been pretty great. That's good. And being, being a Charlotte based business, do you have a lot of Charlotte based clients or your clients? Where, where are your clients and, and yeah. what's your demographic of clients? Are they younger guys, older guys? Uh, are they guys in their, in, 
in middle aged. Mm-hmm. Sure. So I've had like my best friend. I started mentoring here. That was like one of the inspirations for getting into consulting. Mark Eckert. Uh, he's bigger than me now though. So yeah, uh, go look him up instead. Uh, he'd be great for the show. He's here and then two other guys in town. And then we've had some that are moving here actually. And then outside of that, you know, obviously there's because of in pop, there's like a, definitely a big pocket in LA and Nashville. A uh, lot of guys in the UK and then sprinkled around like one of my like most successful clients is in Florida and Orlando. Um, uh, Austin Hull, he has a, a company called make pop music and then is also a producer. Um, they're kind of scattered around. I've had, I have like a fair amount of them in Canada for whatever yeah. reason. Um, well, I know going to Dark Label's website, you guys have a, a list of producers that you work with and, and they're yeah. up there doing testimonials about Dark Label. Yeah. So it's kind of all over the place. We've got guys in Australia, Vietnam. Wow. And then the demographic, just particularly for the college is cool because it's all over the place. It's like 18 year old kids up to guys in their sixties, you know? Wow. Um, Dark Label for the most part, our average is like mid late twenties seems to be kind of like the average. And then of course you have some that are a little older and some that are a little younger, but again, it's people that have like had enough skin in the game to have problems they need to solve, you mm-hmm. know? Uh, but you know, but they're still, um, still kind of going for it. You know what I mean? Like they haven't like decided to do something else, which a lot of people in their thirties kind of decide, you know, Usually, to, like I always tell the young kids, like, "Hey, just a heads up. Like, by the time you get to thirty, most of these people around you are not going to be doing music anymore. That's, That's true. okay. That's just, true. Just be friends with them about other stuff, you know. Um, and then by the time you're forty, definitely it's going to make you into other people. So, like, just keep that in mind. Like, don't focus too much on what they think about like what you're doing, because most of them are not even going to be around when you're thirty. That's so, true. A lot of people drop off for the young kids. Yeah, for the younger ones. For a lot of reasons. To. Hey, Daniel, as we start to wrap things sure. up, how do we get in touch with you? How do we get in touch with Dark Label Music? Yeah, absolutely. So best way is darklabelmusic.com. That'll go directly to the site uh, or forward wherever it needs to go. Sometimes we forward it to other sites and uh, there's contact on there mm-hmm. and uh, or support at danielgrimmett.com. It's kind of my main little email and uh, I'm on Instagram, Dark Label Music, YouTube, Dark Label Music, and then the Music Pro Daily podcast is on all the platforms awesome well thanks again for coming on daniel oh, talking all me, things man. dark label with us oh absolutely thanks all right man have a happy holidays thanks you too thanks for listening to the 52nd episode of the queen city music podcast and i hope you'll go back and check out past episodes you can find the qcmp on all your favorite streaming platforms as always if you have an idea for an episode or would like to be a guest on the qcmp reach out to me at qc music podcast at gmail.com Also, check out our local partners, Records on the Wall at RexOnTheWall.com, Reporting from 20XX at ReportingFrom20XX.WordPress.com, and Queen City Live at Instagram.com forward slash Queen City Live Music. Until next month, be well and stay safe.